Grim Thursday, June 7, 12 degrees 18 minutes south, 168 degrees 50 minutes east, the island of Tikopia. From Santo in the Republic of Vanuatu, we've come 250 miles to this lonely speck in the eastern Solomons, one of the most remote of the South Sea Islands. Here, isolated from the outside world, on an island of great natural beauty that has all the basic materials for a simple but comfortable existence, the Tikopians have shaped their life. Don, owner and captain of our schooner, had been to Tikopia once yeah, before. The last time we were there, we, uh, we were talking with uh, one of the younger chiefs, and, uh, talking about all the kava we drank in Fiji. Uh, how come we see no kava here? You know? And he told me that uh, people uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, drank a lot of kava on the island, but they have no more kava plants. You know? And uh, we told him we had kava on board, but it was only in a dry form. It was just ready to make to drink, and uh, we had no roots or whatever. But if we ever came back to the island again, <clears throat> that's one thing we would bring them is the kava plant. Aaron's routines remained the same no matter where we were. And though I knew that reaching the distant Tikopia was our goal, its extreme isolation was also my biggest worry. If anything went wrong, it would take three days just to reach an airstrip. As the sun came up over our anchorage, I felt my fears subside. We would all learn later that there was a magic about Tikopia. Even in those early moments, I felt its first glimmerings. Courtesy demanded we wait for an invitation, and it was presented by Don's friend from his last visit, Edward Rangafuri, son of Chief Teriki Tafua. Hello, Edward, how are you? How's everything in Tikopia? Oh, everything's all okay. All right, come on board. Yeah, I have some clean coconuts for you. All right. Thank you. Edward, how have you been? Oh, Hello, Edward. Hello, this is Edward. his wife, Anne, and Aaron. Who? Nice to meet you. And Catherine, you remember? And this is little Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Aaron. <laughs> Say hello. Yeah, that's a baby. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Come on over here and sit down, man. Welcome back to the boat. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Aaron. Hello. 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 You want to sit here, Aaron? Yeah. It's a beautiful island, Edward. Oh, yes? Yeah, we We've been watch watching it. it since 4 o'clock this morning. The sun coming up behind it, it looks beautiful. You know, well, you are coming in time. Exactly. This is the festival of St. Barnabas. It's over there. It will be this afternoon. Well, this and can we all come? Yes, uh, you are welcome. We can dance. We'll be dancing and singing. Yes. Oh, hey. All the Tikopian are going to dance with the four chiefs and the people. Will come and enjoy themselves on that festival. Wonderful. Well, if we do that, we can go ashore and take the balloons and we could bring our airplane. Oh, Everybody that have an will, airplane with us. That will be uh, very <laughs> nice for the children. The children here like very much alone. If they like balloons, what would they think of a microlite seaplane? We piled it all in the zodiac and headed for the beach. I was a bit concerned about the wind, which was picking up. I knew the calm we'd had this morning was only a brief respite from the constant trade winds. But if I was going to fly at all in Tikopia, I may have only this one chance, and I was determined to try. In a flash, our balloons were gone and the Tikopians were no doubt guessing just what was the strange contraption that we were unloading. Certainly they found it amusing. More and more people gathered as we slowly assembled the craft until I was sure that half the island's population must be there. They seemed more somber than when we'd unloaded, and perhaps they had a premonition of an impending disaster.
short time we had it running, but the wind and sea had come up to a point where I knew that the fragile floats would be hard pressed to stay in one piece for the takeoff. It was all over in a second. The choppy sea collapsed the starboard float and tripped up the aircraft just before liftoff. I came out unscathed and strangely relieved. In a rather spectacular fashion, I'd shorn myself of a bit of the gimmickry of our civilization, and now I was better placed to try and begin to understand theirs. moments on Tikopia, it was the children who won us completely. With some hours to go before the St. Barnabas dance, Paul and I walked around to the windward side of the island. trade winds that shaped these trees and sculpted this coastline are the winds that brought the first inhabitants to Tikopia. When European sailors were hugging the Mediterranean coasts, the first Polynesians were setting forth into the unknown on voyages of exploration over thousands of miles of open ocean. Using the stars by night and the sun by day, aware of a multitude of signs including the set of the sea, the species and sounds of fish, the birds and the color of the water, they navigated the entire Pacific Basin. The origin of the Polynesians is still shrouded in mystery, and the dates of their settlements on the islands are being put further and further back as more evidence is discovered. Tikopia is thought to have been settled from islands to the east, possibly over 2,000 years ago, and most likely in canoes little change from this one. These men are forming a canoe from a califylum tree with methods they've used for generations. Their only concession to the 20th century are steel axes. I think that one of the most amazing things about Kikapia are people like Walter, who's perhaps the finest carpenter, the finest woodworker on this island. In fact, not just the canoes, but the tuna, fishing rods, the shell lures, the canoe paddles, the bowls that are used for cooking. 375, almost 400 years have gone by since Kyrgios, since the first contact with Europeans, and yet very little has changed. This house, the beams, the rafters, the sago palm roofing, everything is exactly the same. It's as if the Tikopians had taken what they needed from our culture and adapted it to theirs with very little impact and very little change on their own. Virtually all the arable land of Tikopia is cultivated, 
plots assigned by the clan chiefs are owned and worked by the families. Even the fishing areas in the crater lake of the now extinct volcano which formed Tikapia are accounted for. The link between the people and their primary resources is one of the strongest elements of the society. Along the edges of the lake are plots of reclaimed land for growing taro. For us, a meal is a break in the real business of life. But to the Tikapians, the attainment of the meal is the business of life itself. From early morning, the Tikapians work their land, fish the sea, or prepare the means to achieve their evening meal. Cooperation, exchange, and obligations weave the quest for food into a complex social pattern. The extraction of flour from the sago palm is no exception. First we cut down the seco, and then we peel it out. That's this, this yes. huge, this piece of bark here, it's very heavy. What do you do with that? Sometimes we use it for flooring, sometimes we just throw it away. Then we take out the fiber here. Uh, after taking out the fiber, then we put some leaf on the crown. Mm -hmm. Then we scrape the seco. That, that's presumably what this is used yes, for. Yes, that's what we use for. Just to scrape the sago. And once you scrape the sago, then what do you do with, with what you have there, the sago? The girls, we uh, will put the sago into baskets and carry the baskets to, the, to our houses <laughs> and, put, and put them there for two or three days. After two or three days, the shredded sago is taken down to the beach to be washed. It's mixed with seawater and strained through baskets. The residual pulp is thrown away. Once all the sago has been strained and the canoe filled, it's covered and left. It will form a thick paste which will then be sun-dried into the final flour. This will be distributed to everyone involved following a time-honored system of payment for the work, the tree, in fact, every aspect of the labor. The Tikopians look toward the sea for their protein and towards the land for their staples and industrial needs. High on the crater rim, at least one member of a family will work their plot each day and carry back to the village their contribution to the evening meal. Joseph Rotafangi, Edward's brother-in-law, was working his plot and told me about the island's produce. What vegetables, what do you, different kind of vegetables do you grow in Tikapia? Banana, taro, yam, cassava, and coconut, and pana. And pana. And wild? Wild taro. Wild taro. And do you need to bring in any other food from... Any of the other islands? No, because we this grow enough for, for the people in Tupia. We grow our own food. That's only enough for us. I see. Joseph, what what is this here? That's a dumari. Tumeric. We know turmeric is something that we put into rice to, to color it, but what do you use turmeric for? We use for for painting a body. We got, we have a two kinds of turmeric. One is a red, that we use for our, for painting our bodies, and one is a yellow, that we use to to make our breathing red. So to flavor the, the flavor. The and which type is this, red or, or yellow? The yellow. This is the yellow one. I see also that you have a, 
Yes, that's uh, the leaf we use for, for the dancing, you know. For, for dancing, yes. you make it with uh, nice smelling. You know. I see. You see? You smell it. That's lovely, and then you put that yes. like you have around your head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mainly to remember Saint Barnabas Festival. The four chiefs with their people are gathering here to perform some dances of the islanders and the cultures in Tikopi. drum, echoing off the nearby cliff place, signals a quickening of the pace and volume and effort of vital ingredients. The chants can be about fishing for tuna, the birds returning to their nests, or a trip made to the Solomon Islands capital by a village member, where for the first time he saw cars, streets, and bicycles. Mostly they're extemporaneous and repetitive. This is a dancing club, is it not? Yeah, this is a dancing club, which usually this dance uh, club is for the chiefs dancing. It's commonly called, this is a special dancing stick for the chiefs. Is that a special chiefs club and then other people have different kinds of clubs? Or? No, they are all the same, no difference. They copy, yeah. the designs are all the same. But mainly the title of this kind of dance is for the chiefs. Today we're seeing the two villages, one dancing and then the other village dance. And is it true that the one who does the loudest dancing is the winner of the prize? Yeah, that's right.
the dance had finished, I was asked to judge which clan had made the loudest noise. The diplomatic response was thankfully the truth, and I awarded the decision to my host. I definitely think that Tafua is, is the winner. It's most surely the loudest noise I've heard all day. <laughs> under the spell of Picopia. I knew these people were as complex as we were and had their share of human ills and problems, but the harmony they achieved both with nature and amongst themselves through their highly structured system of social and religious activities made each of us feel that we discovered the cliché tropical paradise. In fact, I suppose we had. This afternoon, Edward was to show me how they speared fish. Okay. Now, let me see these, these goggles. Because we normally use a, a, a face mask, a big mask. That's right. You see well with those underwater. Yes, I can see very well. Very nice cobble. And, and this is a... This is a spear. How, how does, show me how that works. Now, this is a spear with a rubber. I tie a piece of string at the end here. Yeah. And I use to pull the rubber with the wire so I yeah. see the fish. And I spear it like this. And there's no barb on the spear. There's, there's here, at the end, there's, there's no, no barb. Yeah, so. no barb there. The same time I got the fish and the same time I fish the wire. Same time you push this to spear, yes. and then grab the fish. Grab the fish. Always know that I grab up to a little wine on the surface of the water. Fish are the most important source of protein on Tikopia. These children are digging channels in the reef in an effort to trap them as the tide goes out. Underwater, Edward is superb. He's like a giant sea lion stalking the reef. His breath holding is equally fantastic, and I timed him on two occasions at just under three minutes. Of course, as soon as you want to film an underwater spearing sequence, the fish disappear. Today was no exception. On a few other occasions, without my camera, naturally, I saw just how effective Edward's spear can be. Conventional line fishermen were having more luck. This fisherman, who drifted through our anchorage almost every day, never stopped bringing them in. Hey, 
As in any school, recess is a time for games. The children here were trying to stack coconut husks in the center before being hit by one. It looked a fairly risky game, but no one seemed to be getting hurt. Despite its remoteness, Tikabia does have a very basic clinic provided by the Solomon Islands government. Okay, I'm ready. Sabra, Sabra, this one. Ah, ah. 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 Well, you're not from Kikapia, are you? No, I, I came from Malaita in the Malaita province. And uh, I'm working in the medical section and I come here to work here. Where did you get your training? I, I, I took my training in Honiara at Central Hospital for three years. And then one year out in the province for practical. Then before I, come, I came over to this province. Do you have a choice of where you go or does the government give you a posting and and then you go there? Uh, really, I, I don't choose, but um, the, the government uh, decided to post people outside. We don't choose of our own uh, what, we, what places we want to go, but the government sent us to places that he wants us to go. That need help. And what are the main health problems here on Pico Pia? The people look very healthy to me. Is there any particular problem that you have to deal with? I think the main problem here is um, TB, and that TB and minor abscess and chest infection. Their diet is not uh, very, very nice. They live mostly on carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. What about the little boy that I saw you looking at? He had something on his head. What was that? Well, I think it's only some minor crutches because of the mosquito. Yeah, there's a lot of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mosquitoes are a nuisance, and the people make smoke fires to keep them at bay. Fortunately, they don't carry malaria. Tikopia is one of the few islands in the Western Pacific without it. One of the principal recreations for the men is throwing the tika dart, the Tikopian version of throwing the javelin. Patterson Lacona, Edward's brother, is without doubt the champion, as the children confirm. Joseph Rotofangi, Edward's brother-in-law, was a bit off form. The point of impact of the hardwood dart is not what counts, but where it finally comes to rest. <laughs> Patterson took me to the official dart pitch, where we paced out the best throws. That's the mark. That's the mark. Yes. I've just paced off 218 meters. Yes. And you've thrown it that you've thrown this that yes, far. I threw it very far. And tell me, now it's grown over. There's cassava being planted on it. But when you have a, a festival, do you cut all yes. the cassava back? We cut out and sweeping around it. I see. Yes, sir. And how often do you do that? Once or twice a year? Yes. After years. After, after years? After, in one year. One year, then you try When the see. cassava is ready, yes. you cut the cassava and you throw this 218 yes. meters. Yes. Well, Patterson, they ought to have a new Olympic record for Tikopia, yes. or a new event in the Olympics. Towards evening, the Tikopians drift into groups near the beach. Work has stopped in the gardens. The tools for shaping a canoe hull have been put aside. Now is the time for relaxation for all except those directly involved in cooking. Edward and his family were preparing a feast for us which allowed me to see how the Tikopians cook. This sago pudding is cooked by stirring red hot stones into the mixture. As it's being prepared, coconut cream is added for flavor. I don't know how much of this he'll remember when he's older. Perhaps none. For the moment, 
is completely open and receptive. It's as if there are no barriers. Everywhere he goes, he's accepted and loved. The Tikapians spoil him. Edward's family have even given him a name, Awitaraki, meaning leeward side of the island. The Tikapians seem so complete that compared to them, I see and feel nature through a filter. I hope that Aaron's Tikapian heritage will be a closeness with nature, particularly the sea. It was time to get going for our first Polynesian meal and Aaron's first dinner party. My presence of this, we call manga, to all other friends who are gathered here, each one will receive one from me. And to the captain of the boat, he's uh, saying in a Tikopian uh, tongue. Thank you. Having another one of two. Thank you. I have uh, one for cross. <coughs> Half a plant. Uh, that I would get, like to give to the chief. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. And Edward, this is for yourself and the chief, because he expressed a liking for them when we had some the other day. It's a box of a box of pipes. Oh, thanks very much, Danny. So I'm... <coughs> this is my present to you. Thank you very much. The manga as the captain of Sally. So, this sugu here is very common to cut the tuna. And as we know that in Ethiopia, when any... Gary Brecken, our cameraman, tuna, and Tony Griggs, the star man, were also presented with gifts. Thank you very much indeed, Edward. Thank you. <laughs> Edward, what, what is inside here? The sago palm and the, the one thing that you can do. The sago palm? And and the milk. Mm -hmm. oh. Taro. 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 Just open up the chicken. Well, the stuff being milk with the, uh, with the chicken too. At night, the Tikapians burn torches in their canoes to attract flying fish, which they scoop out of the air with long-handled nets. The night also gave us a chance for a different look at the reef. Being nocturnal, the lobsters come out of the deep reef crevices in which they've been hiding all day.
The insomniacs of the reef are the corals and the sedentary animals that fear predation during the day, like the feather star. At night, the coral polyps extend, trembling as they feed on the microorganisms the swift current brings them. Briefly, these squid are held in our lights, then streak off in a blaze of color. A curious filefish stayed with us until probably he sensed the presence of this large grouper. Our lights and presence disturb a long-nosed tumbler lunges away into the dark. Night is a time when the moray eels venture out onto the reef, but faced with our lights, this one slowly retracts into his hole. Though they appear fearsome with their mouths opening and closing as they breathe, they are quite friendly. And under most circumstances, if approached carefully, and most importantly, non-aggressively, will accept a friendly caress. Their skin feels like crushed velvet, and once you touch one, your relationship with the sea can never be the same. Very early morning, you've seen the Tikapians washing in the sea. Now, after a breakfast of leftovers from the evening meal, they're on their way to church, backing out of their tiny doorways, the result of low roofs to lessen the wind resistance. Some children find a convenient perch for last minute homework. After the service, the Tikapians go about their daily business, or, in this case, the whole village turns out to sweep up and burn the accumulated leaves. The children who have misbehaved are set a task which they usually complete in pairs. This consists of collecting small beach rocks in kerosene cans and carrying it back to the school ground. Once at the school, the rocks are poured out, counted, piled, and at the next break will be returned to the beach. I talked with Edward and his father about crime on the island. There's a uh, uh, law that's settled by the four chiefs, 
that everything on the island must be calm. No quarrel, no anybody to get angry with the other family. And if there's a problem there, the chiefs will send a word that they must stop not to make any problem between the family. They must be settled. I see. So the and chiefs decide all that. And uh, what do the chiefs find that they are most busy with deciding? Is it problems of who has a piece of land there? Or is the boundaries of land? Is that, is that a problem sometimes? Yeah, you? that's a problem sometimes. Because yeah. the land was given by the chiefs and its family, or I would say a clan, has two pieces of land that can't be looked after by that uh, family. But uh, when family hasn't anybody to represent afterward, it means the land will be back to the chief again. I see. And then he has to redistribute it amongst That's right. his people. This is Chief Tariki Tafwa. This is Edward Rangafuri. Together they represent the today and the tomorrow of the Tafua clan, who have been our principal hosts since we came to Tikapia. In this graveyard, we see the great-grandfather, the grandfather, perhaps 150 years of history of the Tafua clan. Beyond that hedgerow, we can go back over 2,000 years. Here are the headstones, or I should say the backrests, of the principal chiefs of Tikapia. And this is where the chief of the Tafua clan would have sat in council with the three other chiefs to the right and to the left of him, addressing the entire population of the island. These stones were put up today for us because they were cast down or they were told to be buried by the missionaries when they first came but they are an integral part of the history of this island. And it is the chief himself who has put the stones back up for us, and I think he will keep them back up for the future. Two little hands, one, two, go. on Tikopia with about a hundred students each. They begin at six to nine years old and study for eight years before going on to a national secondary school on one of the larger islands. All the lessons are in English. The Tikopians own land on some of the other islands and a number of these children and their families will be sent to them to relieve the population problem on Tikopia as the chief, Teriki Tafua, explained. Uh, well, what the reply from my father is that he saw the island the population is so crowded and that he would like to have the colony to, to be there for about uh, 50 people to go down there. And then it means that not to live there forever, but they will come back to the island and the others will take a turn. I see, so it'll be on, on a rotor basis. It, sometimes some members of your village will go there, spend, what, right. a year or two years? Or three years? Yeah, that's the... And then come back come to the Come back to the Tukupia. So, you feel that otherwise everything in Tikopia is, is fine. You have enough food, you grow your own food. What, what do you need from the outside world? What, what do you order when the 
when the government ship comes, what, what kind of things do the Tikopians want or need from the outside world? I think what we need today, as when people moved on to our settlement there, they got the money, like they make a little bit of copra, and they went to Honiara, and uh, what they would like to bring to the island to buy a bag of rice, some kumar, some other crops from the other, in the Solomon Islands. I see, so really, what you're hoping is that Tikopia does not have to make money, but that the small settlements that you are establishing in other islands will be able to gain enough money to bring to Tikopia some of the trade goods that she needs. Yeah, that's right. Our time on Tikopia had ended, and Edward brought the children to say goodbye. Tikopia, so small an island, but with such a profound impact on us all. The few days we'd spent should have been months or years. Our society has a good deal to learn from the Tikopians. We've lost a sense of harmony, not only with the environment, but more importantly with our own fellow man. We've lost the traditions of hospitality, politeness, and a sense of community. Most important of all, we've begun to lose a sense of family. The Tikopians have all these in abundance. Their society surrounds the individual. No one is ever alone. No one is unwanted. Everyone is important. Individuality is prized, yet the welfare of the group comes before all. For a brief moment in our lives, we were privileged to be welcomed as part of that family. I don't think I've ever been so sad as I was to leave the Tikopians, for I knew that there would be little chance that I would ever see them again. The Tikopians, so proud of the values their culture holds, so dignified and so deeply attached to their tiny island.